In the vast emptiness of space, the Earth has only one close neighbor, our moon, the bright, pale light in the night sky that has captivated humanity from our very beginning. As recently as the 19th century, the moon was still nothing more than an object of wonder and speculation. And then, in 1865, Jules Verne imagined one way to get there in his novel From the Earth to the Moon. In that book, the would-be astronauts used a giant cannon to launch themselves into space. In real life, they would have been squashed into bloody puddles, but for the time, it was considered revolutionary. George Melier poked fun at this idea with his silent movie A Trip to the Moon in 1902, which was inspired by Verne's book and left us with this iconic imagery of the man in the moon. Science fiction aside, it wasn't until 1959 that the Soviet Union made their first attempt to reach the moon with a probe called Luna 1. They missed. Luna 1 sailed past the moon and is still in orbit somewhere around the sun. But at least this demonstrated it was possible. Since that time, there have been many attempts at landing on the moon, but these attempts have a pretty miserable track record. Including the Apollo missions, there have been nearly 40 shots at landing on the moon, with more on the way. 20 of those missions landed safely, including 6 of the Apollo missions, but 15 probes have either never made it to orbit, missed the moon entirely, or crashed onto the surface. So those aren't very good odds. The complete failure of intuitive machines' recent Athena lander proves this is an ongoing problem. While the overwhelming success of the first Firefly Blue Ghost landing keeps hope alive that lunar exploration is still very much possible. So that raises the question, why is it still so hard landing on the moon? As it turns out, there's no simple single answer, but rather a catalog of why so many missions failed. So let's try and break it down into four categories. One, getting into orbit. Two, translunar injection. Three, descending to the moon's surface. And four, landing safely. Let's start with our first category, getting into orbit. The launch window is unforgiving. If anything goes wrong before ignition, you have to wait weeks to try again. Even though it may seem routine today, just getting into space is not trivial. The first lunar probe launched by the United States, Pioneer, was very small. It was basically a cylinder, 75 centimeters in diameter, with a cone at the top and at the bottom. It weighed only 35 kilograms, but its booster exploded 74 seconds into launch, so it never even reached Earth orbit. The next few Pioneers had equally bad success, primarily due to booster or upper stage malfunctions. Now, assuming you make it into orbit, the next step is getting to the moon. For translunar injection, if you want to take a straight shot, you need a lot of fuel. Many lunar probes and all of the Apollo missions used this method. There is another way, called LEDO, which stands for Low Energy Transfer Orbit. This method requires much less fuel by using a series of gravity-assisted boosts, but takes a lot longer. NASA's Capstone mission, which was launched in 2022, took advantage of this method. Capstone is a critical building block leading up to the Lunar Gateway space station and paving our way back to the moon. But just because you start your journey to the moon, that doesn't mean you'll make it there. Look at Apollo 13. While on their way to the moon, just 56 hours into the mission, an oxygen tank exploded, crippling the spacecraft. It took all of NASA's ingenuity, including using the lunar lander as a sort of lifeboat, to get the crew safely back to Earth. Explosions aside, as impossible as it may seem, some probes just plain missed the moon. A small mistake in trajectory over such a long distance can result in a clean miss, and the probes end up in orbit around the sun. To break free of the Earth's gravity, you need to go really fast, about 11 kilometers per second. This speed will take you to the moon, which brings us to our third category, descending to the surface. Once you get there, you need to slow down. In order to do this, every probe so far has gone into orbit around the moon first, and only then prepared to land. When you're in orbit around the moon, you're still traveling around 1.6 kilometers per second, and you have to slow down to zero by the time you reach the surface. Unfortunately, the moon has no atmosphere to rub against. On planets with atmospheres like Mars or Earth, we can use friction to slow us down. You use a heat shield and eventually a parachute to lower yourself gently to the ground. But since the moon has no atmosphere, parachutes won't work. 
The only way to land is the very same method that the SpaceX Falcon 9 uses in its return to Earth. This is called propulsive landing, meaning you have to use a rocket engine to slow yourself down. Many probes fail this part. In 2023, Russia's Luna 25 had a malfunction on the way down, ran out of fuel, and crashed onto the lunar surface. They still managed to reach zero velocity though, which means that there's still a little more to this than just slowing down. And this brings us to our final category, the soft landing. This may be the hardest part of all. Cosmically speaking, the moon is incredibly close, but on the human scale, it's 385,000 kilometers away. It takes over a second for a signal to reach the moon, and another 1.3 seconds for a signal to return. That delay is too long for a NASA controller to put on a VR headset and guide the probe down. The probe has to stick the landing all on its own using its onboard computers. But for every success, there's at least one failure. No matter how smart your programmers are, they can't think of everything. For Apollo 11, NASA selected the flattest, safest, yet scientifically most interesting landing spot, the Sea of Tranquility. However, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were about to land, Neil realized that the pre-selected landing spot was filled with boulders, making it far too dangerous to land. He had to take over the controls and land the eagle manually. He used his eyes and brain to find just the right spot, when they finally sat down safely, they had only 15 seconds worth of fuel left, narrowly avoiding disaster. If there are no humans aboard, the probe itself must figure out where exactly to land on its own. JAXA, Japan's equivalent of NASA, used high-resolution photography to map out the proposed landing area. Their data was calibrated so carefully that the lander was able to land within 100 meters of the intended landing spot. Unfortunately, it landed upside down, as mentioned earlier, intuitive machines used the same approach with their latest mission, the Athena lander. This lander was hefty, it was over 4 meters tall, and weighed in at 2 metric tons. Unfortunately, it suffered the same fate as IAM's prior mission, Odysseus. Athena missed the mark by 250 meters, landing on the edge of a crater, and fell over. It was declared dead. Athena's sister craft Odysseus touched down awkwardly with one of its foot pads coming to rest on a rock, and the whole thing also tipped over onto its side. Neil Armstrong landed Apollo 11 safely because he used his human intelligence to cross that final mile, but for unmanned probes, we don't have that luxury, so what can we do? Another possible approach is in its infant stages, but might just be the answer. Think about the evolution of Tesla's full self-driving software. Up until 2019, Tesla programmers were attempting to account for every contingency in their software but they still couldn't come up with a generalized solution for unexpected problems. The autopilot team realized that brute force programming would never be good enough, so they pivoted to using neural networks, machine learning, and input from Tesla vehicles on the road to train their systems. Now, Tesla is planning on releasing unsupervised FSD in June of 2025 in Austin, Texas, which means they have confidence that a car driven by an AI-powered computer will be safe enough, maybe even safer than humans. Not that we're a gold standard for safe driving. Which begs the question, can NASA and their partners use artificial intelligence in lunar probes to land safely without human intervention in a similar way to Tesla vehicles? The open source DeepQ learning for lunar landers is a great example of how teams will exploit this new approach. The people behind this program use a realistic simulated lunar environment where the AI can learn to navigate and touch down while avoiding obstacles and landing upright. The neural networks in these projects are trained through a series of trial and error attempts, gradually improving their performance by learning from past experiences, just like Tesla's FSD. The Firefly Aerospace Blue Ghost lander successfully touched down on March 2nd using an AI-powered computer vision guidance system. The Blue Ghost used a series of cameras to identify hazards and navigate around them, just like a self-driving car avoids a collision. And in this case, it allowed Blue Ghost to steer itself into a safe landing zone the same way that Neil Armstrong did 56 years ago. As AI technology advances, we can expect even more accurate and safer landings in future lunar missions. While it may never achieve a 100% success rate, such an approach is the closest we can come without putting humans aboard and will pave the way for when humans do return to the moon.